getting spicy in here. This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read some stuff this week. I watched, finally, after the long wait, Dune. We waited to do this episode because we did not know what the conversation around this film would be. Would it be a smashing success? They hit the mark. They did it all. Or they missed the mark. What went wrong? Disaster. Was it worth the wait? No. Right. We didn't know what that conversation would be, and we thought it would be worth waiting one more week to see what the reaction was. And, you know, here we are on the other side, and we still don't know. <laughs> because uh, there's two parts. Yeah. <laughs> nobody knew until the <laughs> title came up. Part one. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's uh, that's this this week has been buzzing with uh, the and I'll put this in quotes because I got a bone to pick <laughs> the green lighting of part two. But it was neither a flop nor a smash. Yeah. Uh, and we're waiting now on part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we are going to be going through Dune as a property, the influences of Dune, the challenges writing it. This mm -hmm. is in the conversation, and it is a property that, ha while having many, many books, has almost no actual media to Adaptation. its name. It, ha yeah. it has yeah. one David Lynch film from the 80s, which is generally not regarded as, I mean, even David Lynch would tell you that it's not good. <laughs> he doesn't like um, to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it that the probably one of the most prominent properties in science fiction and in literature just generally has not gotten its due in film until mm -hmm. 2021. It seems almost like it's impossible. So that's what we're going to be going in. We're going to be breaking into Dune, everything about it, and how we wound up in 2021 yes, and how yeah. we're still waiting for part two. Now we're more waiting for the Dune franchise. I can't wait to understand more about Frank Herbert and the process of building this story because it is one of the largest frame stories that I can point to. Some of the challenges, one of which I had, must confess, did not read the whole first book. It is 200,000 words, 800 pages. We do this <laughs> it's a lot. once a week. We do I it weekly. <laughs> so I focused more on the process and the influences and all that stuff, but I did look into some of it. So I'm not totally illiterate, but it is such Ooh. a massive thing. Since we can't really get into the plot, the epic sweeping scope of this massive thing, I will pinpoint some things. The Lord of the Rings, though, Tolkien hated saying it was an allegory. People sort of compare it to, in the fantasy space, the rise of fascism, the perils of the Second World War, the Industrial Revolution, Sauron's army, that sort mm. of thing. Dune, if you could pin something to it, came out in 65. So it's sort of the science fiction age of Aquarius. It's about environmental stressors, human potential, altered states in the form of drugs, and then developing countries and their revolutions against imperialism. I mean, I, when I'm watching the movie pretty quickly, I go, we just left Afghanistan. I don't want to go back. Yeah. Uh, but, but all my references for the Middle East are much more, much more recent, um, mm -hmm. recent than when this book was written. Uh, so yeah. it was amazing to me, having no contact with the material itself, seeing something speaking so succinctly to the modern day, the problems were still, I mean, we have, um, and not just us, but other cultures have wasted uh, resources in the Middle East for centuries. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is speaking directly to how you can't just come into a place and, you know, take the, the, the cream off the top and leave and think you can <laughs> understand or were there to begin with. I was pretty taken aback by something written mm -hmm. decades and decades and decades ago, speaking to problems that I'm still experiencing in my <laughs> modern day life. A little sad, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's that gives you a little bit of a taste as to the breadth of this story. And this, mm -hmm. if you want to compare it to something, at least on the screen, you want to compare it to Star Wars. Star Wars feels like peanuts compared to mm -hmm. the, the motions of what this story is really trying to discuss. A lot of people, yeah, describe it as like the adult version of Star Wars, the actual interplanetary, not trade negotiations with Naboo, but like actually yes. the psychology of human potential and development and cultures and all of that as it spans many, many millennia. But like you said, written decades ago, first published in 65, here's some of the stuff that he was pulling from, or at least what he says, because he started researching this in 1959. The big thematic idea, he said, began with a concept, and this is a direct quote from Frank Herbert. He said, to do a long novel about the messianic convulsions which periodically inflict themselves on human societies, I had this theory that superheroes were disastrous for humans, that even if you postulated an infallible hero, the things this hero set in motion fell into the hands of fallible mortals. Mm. 
that is mm. a tragic story. And I also don't think that's something that people necessarily so realize. So he's coming least. out, and this is so fascinating coming from mm-hmm. last week's conversation, talking about oh, yeah. you know, My Hero Academia and what they did uh, it, with comic books. We have Dune coming out of the golden age of comic books there through the 40s and 50s. Yeah. So it's a reaction to everything superhero. Uh, and that's fascinating, actually, because mm-hmm. I had not even thought about it in those terms. I have thought about it in terms of myth building and legend oh, yes. building and certain league barking up the tree of superhero s but more of an a legend a myth type thing mm-hmm. with paul so it i didn't make the direct connection that he might be talking about the tendencies in lit in, a, in literature at the time mm-hmm. going like oh we don't need to be like making more different gods and putting all of our <laughs> putting all of our weight into them because eventually they have to hand back over responsibilities to man and man is man yeah his <laughs> his quote in, in an interview in 79 he said the bottom line of the dune trilogy is beware of heroes much better to rely on your own judgment and make your own mistakes Wow. So that wow. is his big nutshell. Obviously, there's a million other things. But yes. And again, following off of our conversation from last week is we're in the midst of the most, you know, it is the most ubiquitous genre right now, superheroes. So then to be injecting into the zeitgeist right now, an anti superhero narrative where it's like, don't believe in Paul. Paul's might be <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, and that's what's so frustrating about the whole thing is like people are like, oh, what's Dune going to be? And it's like, well, we're just getting he hasn't even gotten there. See a part two, you know, like none yeah. of that has happened no, he's, yet. So. He's, he's like barely coming into sentience when the, yeah. when the movie ends. He's like be, he's only now become like a person. Right. So it's like we still have no answers as to is this going to be what people like about Dune or what Dune was trying to say. Right. Literarily. We'll see. So. A lot of the superhero stuff, like I use that word messianic, or he used it, and then I quoted him, but that kind (laughs) of uh, idea of religion, all of those influences are very much embedded. He steeped himself in comparative religion, psychology, psychoanalysis, history, linguistics, economics, politics. I mean, everything that you could do. How did he do all of this was my question. Mm -hmm. He had to be doing something else. (laughs) You can't can't just be Mm. researching in a library for six years. So (laughs) his primary job, he was a newspaper journalist, and that's how he made his money. And he also did short stories in magazines and whatnot. But you can see also a journalist researcher mindset would become so rich with melding of all of those different disciplines. To do that kind of work, I mean, to be able to present a story. I mean, you really have mm-hmm. to connect with the people involved, with the culture involved in that story. You can't do, mm-hmm. you can't be a journalist. You can't, what good is a cold journalist who can't like connect and empathize with the subjects of this at all? Like can't present yeah. the story the way it felt to the people who lived it. Like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another thing that he's connecting to beyond all of those is his actual reporting on the ground. He's a West Coast reporter, lives in Oregon, went to Florence there to do an article about this project where they're learning to control the coastal sand dunes and planting this non-native grass. And he's learning all about this ecology. This is sort of where the the story takes place because he's like, I have all of these philosophical ideas this messianic cautionary tale, Mm -hmm. what can I set this in? And then also thinking about deserts are historically the places that have given birth to all the major messianic religions that Mm. exist and how they have progressed over time and how their followers have changed and shifted and the soup is swirling, as well as the third big thing is his experience with psilocybin in the 60s. This is the time for that. So the spice with the, the sandworms that, that, yeah, the, the tripping, allowing the bending of space. That's how they can move through space is not through hyperdrives, but through mentally altering the physical realm. So he's writing this whole big thing. It's originally a trilogy. Parts of the, the second two books were written before Dune was even completed. He said the last chapter of the trilogy was written before the halfway mark of the first book. He had oh, planned wow. the really big expansive thing. Like I said, I didn't read all of it, but looking at his writing style, getting into a little bit of why it's so beyond all of the thematic stuff, he gets a lot of criticism where people are like, oh, his writing is not good. It's clunky or it's awkward or it's just sometimes people are like, I don't even understand (laughs) what he's talking about. And a lot of that is because it's so dense. I watched a video of a guy who was doing a better job than I could of dissecting why he thought it was good. Mm -hmm. The novel is a third person unlimited point of view. 
if that's even a thing. But basically, it's like you can go into anybody's head and experience their thoughts, and the narrator knows everything about everything. And they can even be thinking about things that happened in the past that we haven't even understood. And all of this yeah. can, even happens sometimes. We're seeing like different tracks mm-hmm. of timeline, different <laughs> possibilities of the future. Right, because there's also all the <laughs> drug stuff. Yeah. So it just is really, really dense. And also, he doesn't limit it to like, because nowadays it'll be like, oh, chapter one is Paul's chapter, and we get it from his perspective. And then chapter two is Jessica's chapter, and we get it from her perspective. Right. But the next paragraph might be somebody else's perspective. Oh, wow. And then the next paragraph is somebody else's And within all of that is all the stuff, the descriptive language about how they look as well as explanations, sometimes not even given of just this is a term that we don't know and we'll find that out in a chapter, (laughs) but you just have to go along with it. He doesn't. Yeah. (laughs) Any fiction that comes with a glossary in the back. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. It's like that's saying something about where you're about to go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because there is much less flowery verbose prose it doesn't feel quite as literary you as really have to else. apply yourself to follow it <laughs> mm-hmm. but he's also like this would be it would be impossible to read according to this person i saw reviewing it in a, in a positive light if he did have the tolkien descriptions of things and the pages right. of exposition about how things look and all that it's like we're barely getting a handle on the political dynamics of a galaxy it, yeah, 200,000 a words for just the first book and they're developing <laughs> the trilogy that simultaneously yeah and, it's and so we're saying that he's may, maybe not the most like eloquent or beautiful writer but that mm-hmm. he is he's got a lot to say so that if you were to add on the the flowery eloquence of a of a Tolkien that I mean how many words would we be pushing here? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and he's also not oblivious to the fact that he is first and foremost a storyteller. So that is why he turned it into a story because he's like I could have my preachings and my musings about philosophy and religion and all of that stuff. I could just be got- a guy ranting on a paper. <laughs> <laughs> or I could like make a story and make you empathize with it. And then maybe you see some of that in you and your choices mm-hmm. in life. <laughs> so that is at the forefront of his mind, but it does make for a very complicated thing that took a long time to put together. One of the things that I did like in the book, each chapter has a small sort of prophetic quote excerpt written about mm-hmm. Paul through a character that then you find out who it is later and how they know about. It's written oh, cool. as if it's like, oh, he's already done all these horrible things or this is you know, his biographer many, many years later. So it lends this sort of dread or a haunting of what's to come. Because like you said, there's also all of this psychedelic visions of what's to come. I get that this is not going to go well well for most people in this story. Right. I mean, and and a lot of the story is focused on trying to get you a, a little bit empathizing with Paul. And could if you could see different paths, different roads laid out in front of you, but then your choices alter that. And you'd have another dream that is now, now it's slightly different because of a choice you've made. Trying to get in the mindset of that, of the of things are coming to pass. They're not always exactly how you dreamt them because you have free will in the middle of that. Mm-hmm. But it is coming to pass. Uh, mm-hmm. and, <laughs> that's so much, I think, in the meditative quality of the movie that I found so interesting. Different snippets from unnamed voices about m- things that even haven't even technically happened yet with where we are in the story. Mm-hmm. It's creating this myth, this legend, going back, you know, this is where the, we were talking about the superhero stuff earlier, but it seemed to me that much of this story throughout all of the books was about the creation of a myth, the creation yeah. of a legend to move and sway public and geopolitical opinions and yeah. to sway power through the creation of a myth. Again, this is why I'm trying to contextualize exactly just how massive this story really is. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to bring up, which we have not brought up this episode in a while, but it was Promising Young Woman we did a while ago. And oh, yeah. I never thought that this would connect to that somehow. But <laughs> so the main character's name is Cassandra, and it's an allusion to oh. those ancient stories. And she can, you know, see into the future, but can't do anything about it. And yep. Frank Herbert pulls from a million different languages and cultures and customs, mostly Arabic Mm -hmm. sensibilities. But one of the things that he does do, the Atreides are the main ruling family, and that's Paul's group. And that comes from the Atreus, which is the line of the king Agamemnon in 
those stories and the tragedy of him dying. Oh, wow. it all it all fits into the <laughs> the, the kind of foreboding sense of tragedy for this character and being a yes. ruler and all that stuff. It's not just one group. He's also pulling from ancient Greek myths, just in the naming all the all the names. And this and is what I love. This is a this is a great episode because much of what we do is we we look at how writers assembled their story. Where were they pulling mm-hmm. from? How were they pulling from? And this is one of the best in terms of what was he looking at? What was he talking about? What was he interested in? Because it's so evident and all meshes together very well, but it's so evident mm-hmm. what he's talking about. This is a really great episode to actually like to, to state, I guess, <laughs> of what we do, <laughs> which is seeing right. exactly how the story came together because it's not like he was just, it was just dawned on him with glorious purpose. Like it, it, he, no, it came after a while. He had to put it together. He, he was feeling things and he had to attribute metaphors to it. He had to do some, some, uh, some swapping out of some mm-hmm. allegories and see what, oh, no, that's saying, oh, if I do it like this, that's saying what I want. How do I reappropriate this, rearrange this so that mm-hmm. people aren't seeing that I'm directly talking about things affecting us in the real world, but that we <laughs> yeah. are we're following a story in outer space and some other time. Oh, no. no, it's really, it's all right here, right now. <laughs> yeah. So what he's doing with that, I love that you bring up, you know, he's purposefully setting challenges for himself to present it in a novel way, but it also creates challenges to getting people to like it and publishing it. The big one that we've mentioned is the religious overtones. It's one of the first sci-fi novels to directly address or allegorize religious issues. Mm. As you're talking about the myth-making, the mythology, even anything religious, writing about it in the in the mid-60s, the separation of church and state, religion is losing control in society. People are considering it outdated. So it's not as much a popular Yeah, I mean, we're in the middle of the, the middle of the contentious 60s. We've talked about it enough on this show. Uh, yeah. What was happening, I mean, just in America at the time, yeah. uh, th- what you're talking about is absolutely in the forefront of the public zeitgeist. But then globally, this is written during the height of the decolonization in the Muslim world, where French, British, you know, when they reneged on the the Arab revolt promises. And then suddenly it's like, oh no, we have, you know, all of that is happening. Yeah. Yeah. So going with that, the Middle East illusions, people were very skeptical at the time of him imagining a world not based on Western Christian mythology, though now the global Muslim population is a quarter of our earth. Mm, It was mm. all the Arabic influence. There's a award-winning science fiction author, N.K. Jemisin, and they were saying, the myth that Star Trek planted in my mind, people like me exist in the future, but there are only a few of us. Something's obviously going to kill off a few billion people of color and the majority of women in the next few centuries. Jesus. All these oh science God. fiction things are all mostly white men. And so Frank Herbert is saying, no, if Islam has survived this long, it will survive in a different format. There will be dozens of different versions of this, and this will propagate right. that he chooses, Frank Herbert chooses to really challenge people's assumptions of of what science fiction could be yeah. imagining a future that isn't what most people are writing about the jetsons or whatever you know well i mean honestly he's talking about real social political problems real cultural problems and he, and like i'm saying he's just doing some name replacement it's all just allegories it's 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 is all we've seen the motions of the story play out through history mm-hmm. you have but you have to be you have to had been in a history class and like <laughs> remembered that part of <laughs> part mm-hmm. about it to, to, to like directly understand but it's it's so much less science fiction that it is talking about the movements of human culture and the world and Islam's place in the world uh, mm-hmm. because I mean it is it is one of the richest and oldest <laughs> religions. Uh, yeah, I mean even in my short time, I I know that cultures and and countries and governments have have wasted. Uh, lives and money in the desert out there while that culture is saying do not come here if you don't intend to understand us like <laughs> yeah well one uh, of the big ter- one of the big terms that he uses in the book i was reading an un- unfavorable <laughs> take on mm. at least with the trailer you know this the movie hadn't come out yet but I, they definitely do it in the movie as well they avoid using the word jihad in the film yes. they say oh a crusade which is a very different thing and creates very different connotations. But Frank Herbert uses the terminology in the book, uses it more than others, and uses it in a way that he understands what it means, because at the root, it's to struggle or exert, could be against one's own evil, against oppression, or even intellectually searching for knowledge, the struggle of that. It's used in the books as a power to fight against the odds. And Frank Herbert is drawing that terminology from 
jihads against the French, Russian, English imperialism. Like I mentioned, the Arab revolt, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, that whole story, yeah. which is sort of lost in people's minds. But it was the military uprising against the Ottoman Empire during World War One. And T.E. Lawrence is this British yes. white guy who sort of <laughs> rallies these troops and then the British renege on their promise to support a unified Arab state. He has an understanding of in the book that he's basing it off of. Yeah, he says like a fuller knowledge of exactly how the term, what the term means and how to use it more so than what we have become accustomed to in the last mm -hmm. 20, 30 years in this country is it just kind of being this misnomer for one particular thought, I guess, mm -hmm. is, is Frank Herbert probably has a much fuller, robust definition for that and is able to use it in a, in a really authentic way. It's changed a lot since he passed away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, and it's funny to me because I had no idea that that would have been absent from the film. I watched the film and because I didn't have any contact with the material beforehand, I was shocked to learn that that was a glaring omission that a lot of people who are, who like Dune, the book, were not happy about, or at least felt it was disingenuous or at least not just like, I don't know, it was kind mm -hmm. of almost a cop out. I mean, yes, I, it, it's obvious why they cut it for the time, the context of where we are in 2021 and general audiences reaction to that. What the word holds for but, most people right. that don't know. Yeah. But is there room to say something more about it? Is there room to <laughs> redefine it? Is there room to present it differently? I don't know. And those that's what I've seen the reaction from a lot of mm -hmm. Dune loyalists uh, that I was mm -hmm. surprised to be like, oh, he was using the word jihad. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. But everything that you tell me right here, I'm going like, <laughs> well, of course he was using jihad. He's a real journalist. <laughs> yeah. And it's a word that exists and it means something and it's it's worth it, putting yeah, in there. It, 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 it's more, it's a, it, it existed before, <laughs> before on the American and, yeah. conflicts in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is an ancient word and it mm -hmm. has much more uh, meaning to it than just what we have become familiar with in the United mm -hmm. States. Not that that's wrong, but we're only looking at it in one way. Yeah. <laughs> and Frank Herbert is using it in a robust way. Yeah. One of the things as you brought up a kind of a prescient thing, and, and this is the last thing that creates a challenge in the space that he's writing, is sci-fi without computers, without uh, mm -hmm, <laughs> technology mm -hmm. in that way, because that was everything. But it was even before computers were anything that anybody had in their pockets. But he was Dude, adamant. He's like... He's like predicting iPads and stuff in a way. He's, they, they're talking about like crystal tablets or crystal sheets that have all their mm -hmm. threads of information on it. And like he's yeah. describing a, a hard drive. <laughs> you know, like, the, yeah. One of the things it's that pretty he's amazing, doing, actually, <laughs> the, the history of it that takes place before Dune even happens in the millennia before there was a war against an artificial intelligence that overtook. So this is one of the jihads that takes place. And so computer technology is banished in the Dune world after that. So it's like people right. being the computers. In this There's a world. whole focus on naturalism, the, mm -hmm. on, on resources, on what yeah. the earth and natural power really is. They they go they kind of bend over backwards to talk to to like say that like conquering powers throughout the world understood where they were going because they had encountered land and, <laughs> and they had <laughs> encountered you know context like that before. But when they came to the desert, they didn't know what to do. And so they failed because they refused to actually harness what was particular about that place. Mm -hmm. Desert power, baby. Worms. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all of that saying that these are the challenges to publishing. The things that you would want to avoid religious iconography and undertones thematically, these Middle East illusions that people don't really understand for the time, not using any sort of computerized sci-fi technology in your sci-fi, forcing that to be, it's about the people and the relationships and the conflicts yeah. inherent yeah. there. Very forward thinking and probably a bit too difficult for anybody <laughs> to want to publish here comes the publication process. He published it as two separate serialized things of the chapters in Analog Magazine, which was just a sci-fi magazine. He said, oh, well, let me put this all together. He expanded it, reworked it, submitted it to 20 different publishers, all mm. rejected. Mm. So it seems like this is never going to be anything. On happenstance, there is a company called the Chilton Publishing Company. Do you know this at all? No. So the Chilton Publishing Company 
I looked into them when I bought a manual transmission Subaru for the first time. The only thing they publish <laughs> is auto repair manuals. They've been around for over 115 years. They're an automotive repair manual. They're the, these exhaustive, very intricate on every make and model of car that ever exists manuals uh, for how to, like how to fix them. Yeah, Napa, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just these big, thick textbooks about your car. <laughs> So the editor of this Chilton publishing company, Sterling Lanier, he read the serials. He didn't, because who's going to pitch them to publish this book? He read the serials from the science fiction magazine. He said, I want to publish this. So he reached out to Frank Herbert and said, can I publish this under our publishing house? And you'll get a bunch of the revenue and whatever. So Frank Herbert said, fine, let's do it. (laughs) The first printing was priced at $6, which was about... I don't know, 49, 50 bucks now. So it was, mm. it did not sell well and was poorly mm-hmm. received upon the first publication. Sterling Lanier was fired <laughs> over the decision <laughs> to publish it. And then it was, oh, a, man. it was a slow creep in terms of getting into the public because they had only made 20,000 bucks by 1968. So three years later, but it gained acclaim with word of mouth. And then when they said, hey, what about these sequels? He had already developed them. He had planned this as a whole big thing. But Frank Herbert was not able to become a full-time fiction writer and get rid of the newspaper job until 72. Mm. So all that to say, the first edition, this Chilton published version, is one of the most valuable sci-fi book collectibles out there. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's got car manual people (laughs) put out one of the most sought after, high valued literature (laughs) publications in the the modern age. It's kind of like the Stan Lee where he said he wanted to do Spider Man, and Martin Goodman was like, "No, that's stupid." And then when he just happened to slip it into Amazing Fantasy or whatever, and he's like, "Remember when we when I loved that? Make it a whole thing." That's kind of that. It's like (laughs) if you think it's good, maybe at least try to do it. Maybe try. I just saw him say that today on the internet. I just saw a (laughs) clip of him saying that exact thing. Anyway, that's that's just it's beautiful. It'll probably be in your algorithms if you're listening. (laughs) (laughs) It's going around the internet. Recipe Stanley. (laughs) And then the aftermath. He wrote six Dune novels in total. So five after the first one. It would be the next two. Kind of round out Paul's story, and it progressively gets stranger with each one. By the end of the third one. One of the characters begins to transform themselves into a human sandworm hybrid, and then yes, that's and it's the main in character the for the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then it's then it jumps thousands of years. All so, that. like, so- they've been calling Dune unfilmable for decades. <laughs> you know, when it comes to the first two books, I go, I don't know. When I look at the third book, I go, I see what you mean. <laughs> and then the fourth one, where that's the main <laughs> character, you're like, okay, <laughs> how are we going to do this? So, yeah. in, t- in terms of, you asked me before we recorded all the expanded properties and whatnot, his son, Brian, and there's a co-writer, Kevin Anderson, they then took over the Dune Helm based on his notes, based on their own inclination. So they're the ones that then write the prequels and sequels and spinoffs. And, you know, there's prequel books about the centuries past where the AI takeover was stopped and they did that jihad yeah. and why there's no computers just tons so Frank of other did one through options. six, yeah, and then his son and these other people did the others. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the six ends on a cliffhanger. He had a planned seven one that that what? they finished as well. <laughs> so because he, oh yeah, my god, yeah. So that's where all of then the Dune literary business. Here we then come to the films. This one they're gonna they're gonna do two. Denis Villeneuve said he'd like to make at least three, perhaps. You know, he wants to cover the first two books, maybe, but he Mm -hmm. had the book on set. He was a fan since childhood. He told them he wanted to do it. And here we are. Dream come true. Yeah. 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 So now that you we we both kind of have a context for the novel series coming into it blind, what did you get from the film? What did the well, film grab you with? Yeah. The, the the main thing that I think I was really attracted to in the storytelling was right off the bat, it became evident that it was going to be uh, a premonition story, that you were going to be, you were going to see images very early that were going to be the close of the story, mm. which is a classic trope. But in this way, uh, in this in this instance, Paul is waking up from images, dreams about a girl on a distant planet that has nothing to do with where he is. I, yeah. and, and I'm getting 10 minutes into this thing. His mom asked him, are you having dreams? He says, no, I know as the audience, he is having dreams. <laughs> 
I know that's where where this is going. So is the the meditative quality of the premonitions and the unsure, the paranoia, the the insecurity of this. Am I crazy? Am I just seeing things? Will they come to pass then when things come to pass, but a little different? Or you see a premonition of a possibility, and then when that possibility is eradicated, you see a new path. I I thought the Mm -hmm. meditative quality of the film was fantastic, and it was something I connected with in the first moments of the movie. I mean, I was dead on when we got to the... I didn't expect that we were actually at the end of the film, but when it happened and the credits rolled, I went, yep, 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 yep. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting. It kind of reminds me of the, as I said, the little epigraphs at the beginning of each chapter in the book where it is this prophetic thing that you don't even really understand that may not even happen (laughs) 700 pages later or whatever. (laughs) But you know, I think they oh God. captured yeah. that. I think oh, that's they good. really, I think they really captured this, uh, the unsureness of you, mm-hmm. you. You think you know where things are going, but can are are they? Are you sure? Can you trust yourself? And much of this is about centering yourself, trusting yourself. It's so uh, compelling once he actually gets there. Once they are in the same place together, and the film ends basically with a smile, a completely nonverbal. Uh, mm-hmm. from Timothy Chalamet of just a smile because as the audience I know what he's thinking is I've arrived I've arrived right. at the moment from my dream and it is real and I can be sure about myself going forward now it's actually a pretty amazing nonverbal moment that I think it takes somebody like Denis Villeneuve to really bring to life yeah well it's, it might also be a false sense of security because as I said Frank Herbert was saying the bottom line is beware of heroes yes, and here we yes, are being yes. like and I oh, love good. and I <laughs> love that I love it I love it <laughs> yeah and so lulling you into like, oh, good, he's finally OK, <laughs> or he knows what he's doing. But that's not what Frank Herbert. Yeah. Wants what you what is it yeah. leading you? To? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I love that. I love that. I like that where I lead where I ended this film is this being sure in yourself and, and the, the, the reassurance and the fading away of the paranoia and the insecurity of that. And I, I like that. But the mm-hmm. story itself serves to say something much bigger than just some like menial coming of age sci fi. <laughs> like right. it's, the chosen it's one. so much yeah. more than that. And what we will do with the Paul character going forward, I think will speak volumes to who we are as a people in our culture in 2021 Mm -hmm. um where we're we're going to be reflecting off of this character and his choices because i think where you're left at the end of dune is you're with him and you're supposed to be you're supposed to be yeah we're on the track we're in the right direction but that's not what that uh, we gotta wait there is Mm -hmm. so much more to this story and where this character (laughs) will go and what will happen to this character and, and the characters that he comes into contact with that it serves to say far more than just yeah, be true to yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. wait, hold on. You may, might, you might be going down some dark roads. <laughs> yeah. So this is part of why, mainly why, I suppose, all of that is so difficult to encapsulate in a film. Here comes the film history of this thing. Why is it decades and decades and decades of trying and failing and one movie yeah, that we've did had get the made. one try by a prominent director that just yeah. failed and, and which I don't really understand. I've never even a try. I've never tried to watch it. I don't know anything <laughs> about it. Um, yeah. So I, I don't understand how it was such an abysmal failure that one of the most regarded sci-fi properties mm-hmm. has not been able to get back on its feet. So you asking me about that led me to look into the history of this. Where did the rights go? What were they trying to do? And I found something quite illuminating and this will make sense mm. once I explain it, but in yes. a certain sense, Dune was already made by the fact that it was not made. And what that means, <laughs> in 1974, a French consortium purchased the film rights from this guy, Arthur Jacobs, who had them, but he died before the film could be made. So they grabbed it. And a Chilean French filmmaker named Alejandro Hodorowski tried to mm. make this film. This was in 74. And okay. he had he had done some really trippy art housey kind of films, but he was just all in psychedelic. He loved it, and he was a master networker. Got this thing going to an insane degree. So he cast okay. his own son as Paul, uh, hmm. <laughs> in, in sort of a weird art imitating yeah. life, <laughs> so imitating thinks, the art. I think he gets it. I think <laughs> he wanted. <Maybe? laughs> he, he wanted uh, Salvador Dali to play the emperor 
And Bravo. Salvador, Bravo. <laughs> got him. Salvador Dali is a, you know, he's a madman. So he said he wanted to be the highest paid person yes. in Hollywood. His fee, he said, I would like to be paid $100,000 per hour to <laughs> act in this film. Alejandro says, you got a deal, but we're only going <laughs> to, we're only going to shoot you. We're only going to need you for an hour. That's your fee. We're only going to film you for an hour. The rest of your lines, we're going to make this robot look alike. And that'll be your character, <laughs> which will speak the lines <sighs> for the rest of it. We'll find a way to film it. And Dolly said, sure, only if I can keep the robot when it's done. And so <laughs> that was the insane the agreement with them <laughs> that got him involved. Orson Welles was going to be the Baron, the big fat Baron. Yes. Um, oh, this sounds incredible. Geraldine Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin's daughter, Mick Jagger was involved. Oh, Just God. Everybody that was anybody in film or in the 70s who wanted to what be in happened? a crazy art house film, they got to writing it and it was a 14 hour script because he's a art house. He's like, this script has to be 12 to 14 hours. It has to be that long of a movie. Oh, my God. 3000 storyboards. They had it all planned out. They got all the artwork. They were doing it. After three years of getting all this thing together, the budget just couldn't be matched. They were hemorrhaging money, and it got canceled oh, by the no. consortium. They just said, we can't do this. I just want to throw out even some more on the technical production side of things, who was involved. So yeah. Dan, Dan O'Bannon, he got to do the special effects, and yeah. I'll explain who these people are, but Chris Foss did the design. Jean Giraud, a famous French cartoonist who Stan Lee and Miyazaki both credit as being mm. an inspiration. He was on there for design. And there was a Swiss guy who had never worked in film before, H.R. Giger, who did mm. the set and character design. No all, of, all of those people went to work on the 1979 film Alien. Yeah. Every, every <laughs> single, basically the entire crew from Dune went and made Alien. So Dan O'Bannon wrote the screenplay. When I heard, yeah, when I heard yeah. Dan O'Bannon, I went, well, oh, okay. And then, uh, yeah, but Geiger, I went, yeah. no way, no yeah. way, no way. <laughs> yeah, so Dan O'Bannon wrote the screenplay. Chris Foss did the spaceship design. Jean Giraud did the spacesuit design. And, of course, Giger won you know, the design for Alien. I just want to note on that, mm -hmm. on, on, on terms of a design aspect, what an incredible decision it was to have different production designers for the different worlds. The Geiger did all of the alien xenomorph stuff. The yeah. other guys did the Weyland yutani ships and what mm -hmm. that all was going to be. I mean, and I think that I, I think that, that relates to Dune because we're talking about different cultures and what they did so well is, I mean, this is one of the only movies I felt like I was actually there. Like, I've never seen a Star Wars movie where I felt like I was on <laughs> on Tatooine yeah. I felt like I was on Arrakis in Dune for real mm -hmm. so it's pretty incredible to see the the amount of talent that was lined up to do that version that then then what they ended up walking over and doing together I mm -hmm. mean it's that's, and that's amazing a, another big piece of it the this concept art and script and storyboards and all that stuff when they were trying to get more money it all got passed around to all the major U.S. studios. So all of it influenced Alien, Terminator, The Fifth Element, and then Star Wars, which, oh, wow. I mean, took so much. If you look at the early drafts yeah. of Star Wars, there's a desert planet, an evil emperor, this boy with a galactic destiny. Earlier drafts had yeah. warring noble houses. There was a princess guarding a shipment of, quote, aura spice, which is the sp <laughs> spice. Oh, no, I mean, no. even like the, the Bene Gesserit, the mental Jedi powers, moisture farming on Tatooine. It's, he uh, saw D Lucas saw Dune and Seven Samurai and tried to <laughs> mash them, mash them together. Mm -hmm. but, but just so much of this film. That's why I said Dune was made by not being made, and this guy Alejandro Hodorowski really put it all into Hollywood and into the film world, and then it got taken and transmuted into seven different sci-fi action films into the 70s and 80s and then now it's too much like that oh no it's too much <laughs> like this right so there's a wonderful i got all of this there's a documentary that's called hodorowski's dune that came out in 2014 mm. where they go back and interview oh, and they him put out the score him. for it didn't they <laughs> i think they so. put out the full score for this unreleased <laughs> movie i saw yeah. the release i saw the press release for this only a few years ago they yeah they, so i'll post this, a link to and the I, trailer. i'm totally forgot about this yeah yeah, so a lot of people did, but there's a documentary if you want to know more about the film that never was, but then influenced a bunch of other films, including Star Wars and the design, and got a lot of people 
this master collaborator brought everybody together and then they just continued yeah. on other projects yeah into what did that guy do did he do what did he go on did he go on he kept doing art house stuff yeah yeah yeah. i mean i don't know it as much because he's a chilean french filmmaker but he didn't stop and i mean he certainly got a a hell of a band together (laughs) yeah 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 no he's not he's not bitter about it so here now then we have this isn't working this film gets dropped Dino De Laurentiis big hollywood Mm. producer then bought the rights from this french consortium in 76 and he commissions Frank Herbert to write the screenplay for mm. what would be another try at it. He writes a 175 page or three hour, much better than 14 hours. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised coming from the man, 200,000 words in the first <laughs> book, the same man, you're like, we got to keep it down. It cannot be longer than 200 pages, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So he at least gets that much done. De Laurentiis hires Ridley Scott in 79. No af- way. After Alien, yeah, <laughs> with some of the production people on Alien again <laughs> to, to make Bring it Bring it on back. <laughs> Bring them back, baby. Now it's coming back around. <laughs> and fascinatingly, Scott wanted it to be two movies. That was his hmm. idea. But they had worked on three different drafts of the script to get it down a little bit more and shape it up. Hmm. Ridley Scott realized it was going to be a lot of work, at least three more years. And his older brother, Frank, died of cancer unexpectedly. So that sort of changed his philosophy. And he bowed out and moved on to working on Blade Runner, which comes out in 82, three years later. Or, yeah, three years after we get him on that. Yeah. Look at the parallels there. Look how closely Dune and Blade Runner (laughs) have been linked ever since since then. I mean, this is pretty crazy that then somebody like Denis Villeneuve comes in. Uh, touches Redoes. both of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Pretty it's, amazing. You can see where it's it's trying to be made and just seems impossible. And different people are adding to it. After seeing the Elephant Man, which is David Lynch's only second major film that comes out, mm-hmm. they say he should direct. He had never read the book, but he goes and reads it and says looks good because he had gotten other offers, including Return of the Jedi, which then comes out in eighty three, right. a year after Blade Runner. I wish that he had done it. I wish that like Luke and the Emperor didn't talk for three minutes and they just heard voices inside. <laughs> but right. anyway, I this version was. <laughs> but now he's on this this version of Dune, which then Star Wars was taking from the one that never got made. <laughs> they they get down on the sixth draft to 135 pages and they say, "Cool, let's do it." The okay. uh, rough cut was four hours. The script, like I said, is is hovering around three hours. The financiers in Universal Studios wants it at two hours, and so Mm -hmm. they have to cut a lot of scenes. They have to use all this voiceover, Mm -hmm. because also in the novel, there is so much to explain and the density of the multiple points of view. Which Um, I think Denny just kind of like replaces with like long establishing shots (laughs) of sand. (laughs) And the looks and and secret. the same work. (laughs) <laughs> and secret handshakes and little looks and and trying not to have all that voiceover. But that was not the yeah. intention. What I adore about this movie and what I adore about Denis Villeneuve's movies is he doesn't pander to the audience. He's not talking down to the mm-hmm. audience. He respects you as an audience member and he expects you to keep up. Uh, I, I just I love movies like this. Yeah, that's that's very much the substance of the book is like, you don't know what this is? Well, you'll have to figure it out or well, yeah, go back that, to the glossary. That's okay. And... We have to move on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are happening and we can't stop. It's a rich story. That means there's time to think about it when you're not reading it and you can go and think about the things that didn't quite connect to you on the first time. Mm-hmm. It's rich. It's and you can, dense. Yeah. So this film that comes out in 84 is two hours tight, <laughs> has none of that stuff, <laughs> uh, earned $30 million of its $40 million budget. And Mm. Lynch does not discuss it in interviews in a recut version of it. It's credited as Alan Smithy, which is the technical production term for I don't even want to be associated with this. So and Hodorowski was certain that it was a failure to the producers and not Lynch because he had a similar situation where he had this epic plan for it and then it fell through kind of stays in limbo from 84 because it was such a critical failure. They've stained it now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Now I have all these images. (laughs) (laughs) And Lynchian, David Lynchian images. (laughs) Yeah. Frank Herbert, he died two years after. He died in 86. So he did see it Mm. and was somewhat favorable to it. But I guess as much as you could be 
that it got done. Right. You know, he wasn't right. like, this is my perfect vision of it. Yeah, he's not sitting there crying going, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there is one thing that a lot of people miss. There was a mini series that came out on the Sci-Fi Channel in what? the year 2000. That covers the first book. And then there's a sequel in 2003 that covers the second and third books. No and way. it won two Emmy Awards and was some of the highest rated programs on the Sci-Fi Channel. I've never heard though. of it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the Sci-Fi Channel in the year 2000, so it isn't yeah, I get holding you. up that much. But it, from what I saw, it's much more expositional. It's more like a hybrid between the novel and a, and the, and a play, <laughs> almost, because they can't really d- do so much of the yeah. action stuff and the giant worms and all that stuff. So. All the effects and all the sets mm-hmm. and all the... So if you want science. more of the... Yeah, political intrigue and throne rooms and that kind of stuff. It's something. It's something out there. But my my thought kind of in all of this is like Hollywood is scared to take on this material also because history has changed. Now we're in post oil crisis, Gulf War, global warming, the hero thematics, <laughs> all of it yeah, yeah. looks really it's weird. It's become tackle. more and more relevant, and, it, and especially in as of late, man, the last 20 years, it feels like this has just come to a head. I feel like Frank Herbert is wildly validated in all, in all of the things that he's pulling on, all the mm-hmm. worries that culturally he saw throughout the world uh, and where it would lead us. I think he was really seeing something. Maybe mm-hmm. it was the LSD, but... <laughs> I think I think uh, history has borne him out to be correct. It was um, the LSD and six years of exhaustive research. <laughs> oh my god! It creates this combination. Yeah, that leads us to finally the current version, which was tried to be made in 2008. It waffled for three years and then was dropped in 2011, and then Who was, was pa- trying to make it then? Paramount, and they had several any, directors any attached. And, yeah, yeah, but it was it was yeah. dropped. And then in 2016 is when Legendary acquired it, and Denis was added in 2017. And then at that point, I I saw a great quote from him. He was talking about how most of the main ideas of Star Wars come from Dune. So he said, quote, it's a challenge to tackle this. (laughs) It's it's a backwards situation now, where if you had made it in 74 with Salvador Dali, imagine all of the cultural implications that that thing would have created- In Hollywood and the rest of the world, but instead we got Could Star, Star Wars, Wars and Alien. Have been made, <laughs> yeah, or Alien or I mean, any of the if, other if stuff. If it had, right? I mean, for real. I mean, just and just taking it down. If you want to zero in just on Star Wars, mm-hmm. if Dune had come out with Salvador Dali and all that, maybe it <laughs> takes away the actual viability to mm-hmm. make. Star Wars. And then if you don't have Star Wars, I don't really know what our (laughs) culture looks like without it right now, because it becomes so a mess, so ingrained in us that to change just this small part about just like some a movie that came out, massive implications on what it would have done to our culture. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Pulling that thread out that it's like Dune sort of sacrificed itself in the adaptation space bled all its parts out and then they became it still became part of yeah media and filmic culture but what i guess is the the important thing is that all of the people who took from it never forgot it they never took from it and said that's mine is that we're making it now in 2021 because all the people who took from it kept saying yeah i loved that Mm -hmm. and everybody who was doing that stuff said yeah i loved that (laughs) <laughs> they kept it alive. They're the yeah. ones making stuff. Eventually, if these are the people making stories and this is the property that they all go back to, they're going to get back to the conversation of like, well, nobody's done it. We should do it. <laughs> nobody's done it right. <laughs> nobody's done it long enough or with enough. Nobody's been, nobody's yeah. been equipped to do it correctly. Nobody's been ha- given the opportunity to do it the right way. It's been a series of compromises and failures. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, what we're standing in now is uh, the industry has come around. It has taken all these things from this story. It has run down all these paths. We have wrung out all of the juice from all of these IPs. Or been afraid of the to- thematics that Dune was proposing. <laughs> yes, yeah. dude. Yeah. Yes, 100%. <laughs> We've gone down all of these roads. Now what? Come back to now the source. We do? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's still, everybody who made all these other routes, they're all talking about Dune. So obviously they get back to the conversation of 
well, somebody's got to do Dune. We need to do Dune now, eventually, because it has been too important to everything mm-hmm. we've done thus far. Yeah, that's. Oh. It's, it's funny that we were that we were so curious about it then, and it's like, well, what's this going to be? And then here comes part two, and we still were like, well, what is it going to be? More waiting for the Dune <laughs> franchise. Oh my god! Because part one did that's... not satisfy enough as to will they really go all the way? Will they? keep the thematics and the all of the plot points. What are they going to do with this richness? story? Where are they going to take this Paul character? Because we said the Paul character and Paul's son becomes a different thing by the end of book three. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'll be fascinated to see where they actually take the story and how they interpret some of this stuff. To see Denny tackle the psychedelic realm of this uh-huh. will be fascinating. And I think we've even come around in that way too with understanding people taking mushrooms to combat PTSD yeah. yes. and like yes. lots and lots of a- advances in these psychedelic have medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely have turned the tide and we can talk about these things more. Now, if you talk about this, um, it, uh, people get it much more than, Oh, that's, that's taboo. That's illicit. That's illegal. Mm. Uh, it's well, we understand more about it now and it's prescribed and replicated in controlled settings. And there's been studies done to prove that it actually helps. And like we, there's a wing of John Lots Hopkins happened yeah, that, since 1965. Uh-huh. Uh, again, in another way, this thing has proven to be relevant in ways that you can't plan on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but we still have to wait. That's the more waiting. The rub. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the rub. God. Taylor, I can't thank you enough. What an undertaking this week was. This is a massive topic. I enjoyed it immensely. Guys, go check out the movie. It's on HBO Max. It's on theaters everywhere. Check it out in IMAX. We're going uh, this weekend to check it out in IMAX. It's one of the most gorgeous things you're going to see in the theater. So, yeah. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Uh, I had a blast. I hope you got something out of this episode. Taylor, you rock. Uh, (laughs) Reach out to us (laughs) at IlliteratePod on Instagram. Let us know what you're reading. Let us know what you're watching. Uh, You never know when we'll do something that you want to know all about. I do want to give a quick shout out before we close to those that commented on Instagram and the YouTube channel about the My Hero Academia episode. We Mm. got a lot of love on that. So thank you, our listeners, who gave us positive comments and told their friends. We really appreciate it. I love that episode. I waited on that episode all summer. (laughs) (laughs) And we're glad that that you liked it. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't do this show without you. We really appreciate all the support, and we will catch you next week. Bye.